All right, so you can start. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all uh, for the symposium on fracture neck femur. Uh, Indian Medical Association, Akola branch, in association with Akola Orthopedic Society, is starting this webinar. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, especially for all the orthopedic surgeons. Uh, and it is going to be a very good academic fest. We have the likes of senior orthopedic surgeons, including President Indian Medical Association, Akola branch, Dr. Mahendra Kade, sir, uh, the treasurer of Indian Medical Association, Akola branch, Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh, sir, as well as uh, uh, associate professor from GMC Akola, Dr. Amit Zadav, and uh, other dignitaries, including famous joint replacement surgeon, Dr. Samir Deshmukh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Mandar Vagmare, as well as Dr. Achin Murarka and Parth Gawatre. So now I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh to start the seminar. Thank you. Ranjit sir, yeah. you can start. Sir. So good evening all. Am I audible? Yes sir. I'm Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh, starting this uh, symposium of fraction eczema and will be delivering the talk on anatomy of the hip joint, the mechanism of injury and classification of fraction eczema. Now the anatomy, uh, the anatomy of the hip joint, it comprises of uh, two bones. So mainly the Ranjit, and, sir, uh, yeah, please sir. escape from your uh, full screen. Don't go to full screen. Yeah. yeah. Now, now the slide is being. Uh, yes, viewed. yes, I can see. The, you know, you all know that the uh, hip joint is a ball and socket joint. It comprises of two bones, the femur and the pelvis, which is made up of three bones, that is ilium, ischium, and pubis. The ball of the hip joint is made up of the femoral head, while the socket is of is formed by the acetabulum. Now, this is a uh, diagrammatic representation of the hip joint. Now, these are the muscles around the hip joint, mainly the gluteus maximus, minimus, the, uh, the adductor, uh, adductors and the vastus lateralis. Now, you can see the cross section in the tie of the hip joint. Uh, in this A picture showing uh, showing the capsule, the trabeculum, hyaline cartilage, and in the, this B, it is showing the ligaments of the capsule of the hip joint. Now these are the ligament anterior uh, anteriorly. This is the iliofemoral ligament and the pubofemoral ligament, and posteriorly is the ischiofemoral ligament. The most important part of the anatomy of the hip joint is the blood supply of the femoral neck and head. You all know that is uh, already a precarious blood supply. It is uh, the blood uh, supply is given by the medial circumflex femoral artery and the lateral circumflex femoral artery, which are the branches of deep femoral artery. The, the tributaries from the medial circumflex femoral artery goes to the uh, femoral head, and the branches from the lateral circumflex supplies the neck of the femur. Another important pattern in this anatomy is the trabecular pattern of the proximal femur. There are important trabecular patterns in the proximal femur and it occurs according to the whole flaw in response to the uh, bone on stress. Mainly, these are the, uh, this is a, the radiographic and graphical representation showing the principal compressive group, the principal tensile group, the secondary compressive group and secondary tensile group of this uh, trabecular pattern and these are what's uh, at and on the radiographic picture of the trabecular pattern, you can see whether the bone is uh, normal, is osteopenic or osteoporotic. A second part is the mechanism mechanism of action of the, how the fracture neck femur occurs. In the elderly, the elderly patient, the fracture usually results from the simple fall from standing height. In severe osteoporotic patient, the fracture may also occur by just a twisting, uh, twisting in the hip joint. Uh, itself, twisting in the hip joint, and it, and it is in the hip itself which causes the reported fall after fracture. 
in typical fracture the patient rarely have any symptoms the patients with renormal symptoms may have a space fracture in the femoral nerve in the younger individual it usually occurs with a high velocity trauma or usually high energy mechanism now many factors uh, affect this uh, fracture it's a muscle weakness the impaired uh, vision the impaired uh, uh, musculature the age when this person falls now again how, what is the impact how it how the patient fall what is the velocity of fall and all these causes in the fracture this is a uh, typical gra diagrammatic representation of the fracture after the fall, how the fracture after occurs after the fall now you can see if a extended thigh uh, just touches the ground it can causes either the dislocation of the joint or the fracture if and there is a impact there is a uh, impact on the ground the extremity gets abducted and externally rotated causing the fracture neck femur again if an adult falls we can have variety of these factors including the iliac crest to the shaft of femur but the most common is the fracture neck femur now another part of this presentation was the classification of the fracture now, usually it is grossly classified as intracapsular extracapsular intracapsular mainly the fracture of the head and neck neck uh, there are again uh, subdivided into the subcapital fracture trans cervical fracture and basic cervical fracture now the most commonly used classification uh, in our orthopedic literature is the gardner's classification of fracture we divide the fracture in four groups based on the the gardner's classification is based on the uh, based on the degree of displacement uh, which is judged on the ap radiograph uh, ap radiograph determining the relationship of the trabecular pattern the trabecular pattern in the femoral head to those in the acetabulum the gardner's classification has been widely used and is the probably the most frequently utilized classification system in the orthopedic literature pertaining to the femoral neck so it has been criticized for the less number of uh, less number of cases in gardner's type 2 uh, less number of uh, small number of cases fulfilling the criteria of the gardner's type 2 factor uh, how it is uh, classified the gardner type stage 1 is an undisplaced incomplete including valgus impacted fractures garden type 2 are undisplaced but complete fracture garden type 3 is complete fracture but incompletely displaced and garden type 4 is complete fracture and completely displaced this another uh, uh, picture showing the garden type 1 type 2 type 3 and type 4 fracture another classification uh, which is commonly used is a powell's classification it is based on the plane of fracture neck femur now the powell has described the three separate types of fractures based on whether the plane was vertical whether the plane was oblique or transverse now it was proposed that the classification would predict uh, rather than the classification would be predictive of fixation of non union uh, predictive of fixation failure of uh, non union of fracture neck femur with an increasing angle of fracture this can be said that uh, type 1 the where the powell angle is less than 30 degree it is labeled as type 1 fracture the powell angle less than between 30 to 50 degree is labeled as type 2 fracture the powell angle more than 50 degree is type 3 fracture another classification is ao ato classification of fracture neck femur and you all know that is a comprehensive classification of long bone is an alpha numeric system based on the based on the bone the location of the fracture and the fracture morphology of the femoral neck fracture is all designated as uh, 31b now the subcapital fractures also can be classified as valgus impacted non displaced uh, non displaced and displaced and uh, these uh, basic cervical fractures thank you all for my uh, just brief introduction to the uh, anatomy and anatomy of hip and uh, classification of fracture neck femur now i hand over the mic to dr pat gawatre who will be talking who will be giving his talk on pre pre operative evaluation thank you dr pat and all the 
Yes, sir. I am not able to connect. Oh, you are there. Yes, Hello. You are there. Am I audible? Sir? Yeah, yeah. You are audible. Okay. So, uh, to my topic for today is the preoperative evaluation of neck femur fractures. Uh, so, I will be starting with my presentation. Yeah. Start you just start your video. Yeah. Yes, sir. So there is slight glitch there in connection. So I'm not able to share my screen. What's the problem you're facing, sir? Uh, just a sec. Zoom. My Zoom window is not opening. Do you have your presentation open, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. My, pres my presentation is open, but it is not, I'm not able to share it. Okay. Uh, when you click on the Zoom button in the bottom. My Zoom window is not opening completely. Yeah. There will be two windows. Select the second window. I cannot see the share my screen option only. There's a green button, sir, which says share screen at the bottom. Do you have the Zoom window in front of you? Yeah. Somewhere. Yes, we can see your screen, sir. Yeah. Sorry for the delay. So basically, I'll be starting with my presentation. It, it is on preoperative evaluation of neck femur fractures. So the objective of uh, my sound is echoing actually. Yes, please disconnect from the other device, sir. Yeah, yeah. So the objective of a preoperative evaluation, uh, preoperative uh, evaluation is to evaluate the general condition of patient, uh, the medic medical comorbidities and hemodynamic status. So uh, this will be essential for uh, giving anesthesia and uh, going ahead with the surgery. So another thing is to understand the fracture morphology and uh, uh, understand very, whether there are any associated injuries. Uh, so this will guide us whether uh, the fracture is amenable to be fixed or to replace it. Uh, the uh, preoperative evaluation is essential to uh, plan the postoperative care and rehab of the patient so that the patient returns to the pre-injury status. Uh, the aim of the preoperative evaluation is to optimize the patient hemodynamically so that uh, the patient uh, can undergo anesthesia and surgery. Uh, to be prepared with the inventory of implants and prosthesis and instruments on table uh, and transfusion needs, if at all needed, and the medicines that are required. Uh, it, is also essential, uh, it is also essential to so that we are prepared for a plan to effectively counsel the patient and the relatives regarding the degree of risk involved, post-operative care and expectations of the patient, and to improve the patient outcome ultimately. There are, so there are three ways of evaluation. First is clinical, second is radiological, and third is the routine lab investigations or any other investigations that we do around with, uh, along with the cardiac evaluation. So the clinical evaluation essentially uh, can be divided into two. It is surgical evaluation and medical evaluation. So surgical evaluation, in surgical evaluation, we try to know the duration of injury so that we know whether the fracture, even after fixation, would unite or not. Or it is uh, only the or only the prudent decision is to replace it. Uh, another uh, thing is we consider the age of the patient, so that that again guides us regarding the, uh, the decision to whether replace or fix it. Preoperative functional status of the patient and the, the neurovascular status of the limb. 
any associated injuries are there or not whether the limb length is uh, there are any changes in the limb length or whether there is associated deformity of the hip whether the patient is alcoholic tobacco consumer tobacco chewer or smoker so uh, this will again be essential to understand whether the fracture uh, would have any problems in union if at all it is fixed uh, so the also the patient if at all has a history of steroid intake or intake of immun immunosuppression drugs uh, another uh, clinical evaluation is for the medical uh, from the medical point of view so that we know the general condition of the patient general examination is done uh, we understand we want to know the body habitus body weight length of the patient whether the patient has pallor or has any ictus so that we can correct it preoperatively the neurological and cognitive status also is essential because if we replace if we do a hemi replacement sometimes the patient who don't have proper neuro cognitive status they might dislocate the uh, prosthesis and then the cardiac function needs to be evaluated and lung functions so the lung function is again essential when we do a cemented uh, 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 cemented uh, uh, prosthesis in that case the emboli if the patient has uh, de decreased lung functions can lead to uh, pulmonary embolism of cement uh, radiological evaluation is uh, is essential to understand the obvious type of neck femur fracture whether it is type 1 type 2 or type 3 that will again guide us whether uh, we can fix it directly or we need to do a valgus osteotomy to increase the chances of union or whether it is not amenable to fixation so that we can replace it again the bone density can be uh, we can get an idea of bone density on the x ray we can understand whether the skeleton is mature or immature so again so that in case of fracture fixation we don't cross the physis in case it is an immature skeleton uh, we also get an idea whether the fracture is fresh or neglected or it is traumatic or pathological or a stress fracture uh, the status of opposite hip joint or lumbar spine is also uh, we can also understand it from a radiological evaluation uh, the other lab or other investigations that we do are routine blood workup, which includes a complete blood count, liver function test, uh, renal function tests, coagulation profile. Uh, that is essentially done when we don't when we want to do a joint replacement type of surgery in cases of uh, geriatric patients, uh, serum electrolytes, blood group of the patients, HIV, HBCG status, and HCV status. Uh, urine also can be uh, urine is also checked for uh, routine and microscopy so that we know that there is no urinary tract infection which may lead to infection of the prosthesis. Additional investigation that can be done in case of pathological fractures are serum vitamin D3 levels can be uh, checked, PTH levels can be checked, calcium levels, alkaline phosphatase, serum LDH. These are essential when the uh, fracture is pathological. ESR and CRP should be done when we suspect that if there, if there is any residual infection or any kind of infection is ongoing in the body, so that we need to do these markers. Then chest X-ray again for uh, understanding the pulmonary uh, pulmonary condition of the patient. HRCT chest in the times of COVID now has become essential in most of the cases uh, if the patient is symptomatic. And pulmonary function test to understand the vital capacity of the patient so that in case we do a uh, cemented prosthesis in that we uh, are prepared uh, for the eventualities and ECG and 2D echo in case the, uh, the for the cardiac evaluation so that we know the cardiac status of the patient. Thank you. So now I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Amit sir for his talk. Yeah. Uh, am I uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Parth, uh, for inviting me and for covering the preoperative pre evaluation in quite a detail. So, coming to treatment of fractured neck femur, I am going to cover this topic in uh, two different lectures. Uh, treatment options are for any fracture are conservative and operative. First is conservative. Is there any role of conservative treatment in fractal neck femur? Uh, the answer to this question is yes. Uh, it is a treatment in occult fractures, undisplaced, valgus impacted fracture in a medically unfit patient. But having said that, there is a 19 to 46 percent 
risk of displacement, which is quite significant. And non-union is also twice as common as compared to operatively treated patients. So coming to operative treatment, what is the rationale behind the operative treatment? This fracture neck femur is a, is a biological problem. Blood supply is the key. There is a kinking of vessels before reduction, but it is reversible after reduction. Capsular tamponade is also reversible. Only thing in our hand is a mechanical stability. So what is the timing of surgery? So it has been, it has been proved by many studies that whether you operate within six hours or whether you operate after 24 hours or after 48 hours, the final or long-term results are same. So, so one thing is clear that it is not an orthopedic emergency. So when should it be operated? It should be operated as early as possible once all factors like surgeon, OT, OT related, implant related, patient's fitness and anesthesia related, all factors are favorable for surgery if needed open surgery. So what are the operative options? Operative option can be a closed reduction internal fixation or it can be open reduction internal fixation. So what are the closed reduction methods? There are various closed reduction methods described in literature like Whitman's method, Mezzi's method, McElevenny's method, Dairley's method, Wellmerling's method. These are the closed reduction methods with hip in extension. While Ledbetter method, Smith-Peterson method and Flynn method, these are the closed reduction methods with hip in flexion. We will discuss few of them. First is Whitman's method. This is most commonly used by all of us. It is a reduction method with hip in zero degrees of flexion. The extremity is externally rotated and abducted approximately 20 to 30 degrees. And just enough gentle traction is applied just to regain slightly more than normal length. And then the extremity is internally rotated almost up to 30 degree, sometimes more than that. So most important is internal rotation. It requires a significant internal rotation. You can see the leg will look like this. The foot will look like this. If you see from the foot end. And this is the AP X-ray with hip in 30 degrees of internal rotation in which you will not be able to see lesser trochanter. So what is the lead better method? Lead better method is a method in flexion. Uh, you, you can try it when Whitman's technique is not successful. The affected limb is flexed to 90 degrees and thigh is slightly internally rotated and then traction is applied. The limb is then circumducted into abduction, maintaining the internal rotation and brought down to table level in extension. The reduction can be evaluated clinically by heel palm test. If the surgeon can hold the heel of the patient without any external rotation, that means it is anatomically reduced. One most important disadvantage of this method is while doing flexion and circumduction, you can break the spikes of the fracture fragments. If the spikes are broken, then it is very, very difficult to get anatomical reduction. So what is the Flynn's method? The Flynn has described one method uh, as Dr. Ranjit sir has beautifully described in his anatomy. That is capsule and ligaments around the hip joint are in spiral shape. So they are, they are like in tight pack if in, in extension. So Flynn has described a, a traumatic uh, maneuver in flexion for minimally displaced. It is not, he has not advocated it for displaced fracture, but it is minimally displaced. Once you flex and abduct the hip, these fibers become loose pack and they become a shape of an hourglass. So in this, in this, it facilitates the reduction. Once you give traction in line with uh, neck femur, then most of the time, maintaining the internal, internal rotation and extension, most of the time will you get acceptable reduction. So one more method is Wellmergin's technique. This technique we, we commonly use for reduction of distal femur sharp fracture in which uh, the surgeon applies a wrestling hold like one forearm on the anterior aspect of the thigh, other on the posterior aspect of the popliteal fossa or uh, distal thigh and surgeon locks the hand together and the reduction is uh, achieved by slight internal rotation and elevation of the one of the forearm. So once we do all these reduction methods, how to see that it is acceptable? So Garden has explained or Garden has proposed a Garden's alignment index, 
in which he states that this principal compressive uh, trabeculae, the central axis of principal compressive trabeculae, make an angle of 160 degree with the calcar or medial cortex of the femoral nail in AP view and 180 degree angle in the lateral view. So any angle between 160 to 180 degree on AP and lateral view is acceptable. But there is a practical difficulty with this. Under CM guidance, it is difficult to see this trabeculae very accurately. So this method is difficult to apply in practical in OT. So what is the Lowell's S curve? Lowell's has proposed whenever once you get a cortical anatomical reduction, you will see or you will be able to see shallow S curve on one side and a reverse S on the other side in both AP and lateral. Well, if there is no anatomical reduction, the S becomes flat and it becomes C on one side and other side there is a sharp apex. So this is not acceptable. So uh, even after doing many reduction maneuvers like Ledbetter, Wittmann's, and if you are not happy with the reduction, so what are the intraoperative reduction maneuvers to fine tune the final reduction? This is a valgus reduction. This is this usually happens when our assistant gives excessive traction. Once you get this, this is difficult to reduce. Many times it may require open reduction. So in such cases, you can put a 2.5 or 3 mm K wire directly into the head to derotate it to, to the virus. You can put percutaneously a bone hook into the greater trochanter to pull it laterally or you can put one towel or sheet to pull it laterally or you can put a shant screw in the distal fragment in proximal femur to pull it laterally and you might get away with a good reduction, acceptable reduction. Again, k wires used directly into the head to fine tune your reduction. Many a times the, there's a posterior sac because of the weight of the thigh in which you can pull it anteriorly with the help of a towel or a sheet. So in the end, what are the general reduction principles? Most important is your reduction has to be very gentle. A valgus reduction is preferable because it is inherently more stable. A virus reduction has higher risk of fixation failure. 20 degrees of virus reduction is associated with 55% of risk of failure. A posterior angulation should be less than 20 degrees. Nowadays, it is said that it should be less than 15 degrees. The risk of avascular necrosis is lowest with anatomic reduction. Either virus or valgus increases the risk of AVM. Thank you. Uh, I invite Dr. Achin Murarka for his talk. Thank you, sir, for uh, such an enlightening talk. It was a good lecture regarding the maneuvers. Uh, once uh, we fail to uh, close it, reduce, so how to uh, approach the uh, neck of the femur uh, is my talk. So, <clears throat> uh, there are two ways to do it. First one is the anterolateral approach and second is the anterior approach. So let's start with the interlateral approach. The interval is between glutei and tensor fascia lata. It is a limited access to the hip joint along with the lateral proximal femur. Uh, well positioned retractors and adequate soft tissue releases is important. Uh, what are the difficulties encountered? If the extremity is kept in extended position in traction, the exposure to the femoral neck through the anterior capsule can be extremely difficult because of tightness of anterior and the anterolateral thigh and hip muscles in this position. Uh, the femoral head is largely covered and within the acetabulum is difficult to manipulate and the fracture is not easily aligned even with it exposed and visible. So uh, let's start with the incision. Uh, the incision should, should extend 7 to 10 centimeters proximally of the greater trochanter and it should be slightly curved anteriorly and similarly 7 to 10 centimeters uh, distally over the femur. Uh, once the uh, skin and subcutaneous tissue is uh, separated, we have the tensor fascia lata uh, uh, visible to us which should be uh, cut along the posterior border. Uh, now once the te uh, tensor fascia lata is uh, 
retracted with the help of retractors we can see the greater trochanter the gluteus medius muscle and the vastus lateralis distally so now here we have to develop a plane between the gluteus medius and the tensor fascia lata muscle so this should be done by blunt dissection care here should be taken there are certain vessels present at this juncture which should be properly ligated so once you develop the plane between uh, the gluteus medius uh, and the uh, tensor fascia lata muscles uh, the slowly the hip capsule will be uh, exposed but to aid in exposure uh, we have to place a, a retractor anteriorly over the head uh, and this here care is to be taken not to injure the superior gluteal nerve after uh, uh, placing two more retractors anteriorly and posteriorly we need to cut the vastus lateralis muscle from the anterior inferior portion of the grid of the trochanter uh, as soon as we do this the complete hip capsule will be exposed uh, so uh, we need to we can either cut it only in the longitudinal manner or we can extend it in the t manner so that we we get adequate exposure of the head as well as the neck so once this is open uh, two retraction sutures should be applied anteriorly and posteriorly uh, which aids in uh, proper exposure here the lateral traction and repositioning of the leg can improve the visualization once the fracture is uh, exposed then the it should be reduced anatomically under vision and cm and once uh, the fracture is fixed we have to close the capsule properly and the other rest of the uh, tissues now coming to the anterior approach it is also called as ilio femoral or smith peterson approach the anterior approach provides the most direct access to the anterior aspect of the hip uh, in this approach we need a separate uh, percutaneous incision for screw placement or a separate lateral incision for sliding hip screw coming to the incision we should start the incision along the anterior half of the iliac crest till the anterior superior iliac spine and from here we have to curve the incision down so that it runs vertically uh, vertically for 8 to 10 cm so in this uh, exposure we we should know two different planes the superficial is between two nervous planes and deep is between two uh, muscles the superficial goes between the separation of sartorius and the tensor fascia lata and once this is separated we need to again go between the internal nervous plane of pectus femoris and gluteus medius so once we incise the skin and soft tissue uh, we will we will be above the uh, fascia of tensor fascia lata here we should take care Uh, to identify the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve it should not be damaged uh, uh, for uh, for for uh, separating the uh, sartorius and tensor fascia lata it is better to externally rotate the leg so that the sartorius muscle is uh, tense and it will help in identifying the plane uh, one important tip is you can you can you have to se start separating it 2 to 3 inches uh, from below the asis Uh, going too proximally can uh, lead to difficulty in finding the plane, and it should be done bluntly. Once you identify the plane, then inside the deep fascia, and it should be on the medial side of the TFL. Uh, once the once the TFL and the sartorius muscles are separated, then we come to the deep cervical dissection. Here, the ascending branch of the lateral femoral uh, circumflex artery comes, and it should be ligated. Uh, it, it, one important thing, if you are having uh, difficulty in finding the uh, deeper plane, palpate the femoral artery, and the femoral artery is always uh, too medial. If you if if you are palpating the femoral artery directly, it means you are too medial to the plane. So you should try to find it on the lateral aspect. Uh, after separating the deep layer, we need to cut the rectus femoris from uh, both its uh, straight head as well as the reflected head. once we cut this uh, the hip joint capsule is uh, part uh, is exposed and then we have to retract the iliopsoas tendon medially once we do all these things the hip capsule will be completely exposed and uh, we need to incise the hip capsule and that will uh, give us exposure to the head and the neck proximally and distally this incisions uh, this approach can be extended 
for applying the plate or uh, for any work on the EDM side. Thank you. I would again like to invite Dr. Amit Jadav sir uh, for his talk on fixation modalities. Thank you. Thank you, Achin. Uh, let's come to fixation modalities for fracture neck femur. Uh, you know, these are all the controversial issues going in the India and worldwide. We can, I think we can add one more to this is fracture neck femur. Why? Because everything about fracture neck femur is controversial. So fact is that fracture neck femur remains in many ways till today. The unsolved fracture as far as the treatment and results are concerned. So it's an unsolved mystery. So what are the fixation modalities? Multiple cannulated cancellous screws, DHS with derotation or anti-rotation screw, a primary valgus osteotomy, role of primary valgus osteotomy, and we will discuss about few newer methods of fixation. So everybody does this, multiple cannulated cancellous screws. Uh, what are the indications? Indications is valgus impacted fracture neck femur, undisplaced fractures, subcapital fractures, vowels type 1 and type 2 with good bone quality without any comminution. Rarely in vowels type 3, but it is not a treatment of choice for vowel 3. So what are the advantages? It is It can be done percutaneously also, so minimal soft tissue exposure and blood loss. It provides adequate stability in a favorable fracture pattern and bone quality. Fixation is usually straightforward and a sequential compression is possible with multiple cannulated screws. So what are the disadvantages? It requires stable reduction and stable fracture. A risk of secondary displacement is always there because screws are not good in resisting shear and varus forces, especially in a poor bone quality. There is a risk of avascular necrosis, non-union, and there is a risk of Hydrogenic subtrochanteric fracture, if you take your entry for calcus screw below the lesser trochanter, and even in that you try multiple attempts, then in that case there is a possibility of hydrogenic subtrochanteric fracture. So there are multiple patterns can be uh, used for fixation, of, uh, fixation by cannulated screws. Most widely used is this D, that is reverse triangle. Uh, so one is one, what is the biomechanical uh, um, point in fixation of cannulated screws is that if you if you put a screw like a pencil in the cup means it is not supported by the cortex then whenever there is a loading it is likely to fail so dictum is that you should give the neck the screws in a cortical support they should be as close to the cortex as possible to give the favorable result the same slide, you should give cortical support. This calcus screw should be as close to the calcar as possible. This inferior one in AP view. And this posterior screw should be as close to the posterior cortex as possible. So what is Powell screw? Powell screw is a screw used in Powell's type 3 fractures. It is a, it is, it is a screw which is placed perpendicular to the fracture line which produces anti-shearing, anti-rotation, and it increases interfragmentary compression. Powell screw can be put in two ways. One is it's, uh, one it can be put like from greater trochanter, and it takes purchase into the inferior part of the neck, inferior part of the head. And second, it can be uh, placed as a bicortical screw, starting from lower part of the greater trochanter and piercing the calcar. So second is a DHS with derotation screw. Uh, main indication is the Powell's type 2 and Powell's type 3 fractures with osteoporosis with combination. So what are the advantages? It's an angle stable implant, biomechanically proved little superior over the multiple screws but not functionally. Fixation is usually straightforward. What are the disadvantages of DHS? It requires a satisfactory reduction, usually requires one more screw for rotational stability. Because the exposure is more, there is little higher risk of infection. There's again, it's as it's a collapsing device, there's a risk of secondary displacement. There's an increased risk of avascular necrosis. 
as well as non union so uh, i underline it because what is the reason for increase of vascular necrosis with dhs is this the sliding hip screw produces mal reduction by spinning it literally spins the head segment usually in hard or young bone so it is despite of abundant provisional fixation you put any stinman pin you put multiple k wire whether you put a 6.5 anti rotation screw first but this in hard bone this sliding hip screw is so strong rotates it it rotates the femoral head and it may cause irreversible damage to femoral head blood vessels producing a avn so dhs with de rotation it is said that for fracture neck femur two hole side plate is sufficient but most of the time we don't get two hole side plates uh four hole side plate can make a future thr difficult because length wise uh, a regular stem may not be sufficient we may have to use revision stems if at all future thr is needed so this is a adolescent patient managed with dhs and de rotation screw Uh, DHS can be done as a keyhole surgery uh, with minimal exposure, like three to four centimeter incision is sufficient for doing keyhole DHS. This case is done by keyhole DHS. This was a very tricky case, was having an hip ankylosis on the opposite side, so this was very very tricky to give position, traction, and multiple problems. One more case managed with DHS and derotation screw. Uh, coming to role of primary valgus osteotomy, what is the indication for primary valgus osteotomy? To me, is a delayed presented neck femur fracture with high Powell's angle is one indication. Powell's type three fracture with osteoporosis is second indication. Mainly, valgus osteotomy is reserved for non-union neck femur fractures. What are the advantages of valgus osteotomy? You can convert a Powell's type three fracture to type two and type two to type one. by uh, by by uh, converting it the shearing forces are converted into compressive forces which facilitates the union the main disadvantage is it makes future thr difficult but thr is still possible in such cases also so in short this is a primary valgus osteotomy this was a 35 year old female patient presented after one month of trauma because of some economic concerns so first the reduction was achieved by close reduction methods dhs uh, sorry uh, the de rotation guide wire and uh, a guide wire for richard screw was placed as perpendicular to fracture line as possible first the de rotation screw was put then the dhs uh, richard screw was put then at the level of lesser trochanter a pre planned lateral wedge was calculated and it was uh, resected and then it was fixed with a five hole side plate so multiple cc screws and dhs with de rotation screw they can produce a uncontrolled collapse means they are collapsible devices but their collapse is not controllable so uncontrolled collapse will lead to neck and limb length shortening because of neck shortening there will be reduced abductor lever arm which will produce lurch and easy fatigability into the patients so functionally these patients have poor outcome even after union so this this is this leads to we have to think on newer things so what is this is bdsr this is biplane double supported device uh, it was devised by philippo what is the principle they say that it offers better stability in that two screws are buttressing the calcar a distal screw which is very long usually it is required is more than 100 mm <coughs> you have to specially order it distal screw placed at a steeper angle and is supported on large area along the distal and posterior cortex of femoral neck following its spiral anterior groove so they say this bdsf achieves the strongest possible fixation construct which can allow a immediate full weight bearing so these many centers have started doing this long term data is yet to come but we are waiting for the long term data and many many centers are suggesting very good favorable outcomes with this so dpu synthesis has come with its femoral neck system in which there is one this is a pick and this is a de rotation screw in different angle this they say will uh, provide a will superior rotational stability 40% more than 
THS and 150% more rotational stability as compared to cannulated screws. So this is Smith and Nephew Conquest femoral neck system. There is a spring which spring loading provides continuous compression at the fracture site even post-operatively. These are locked screws, so this, this, they will avoid excessive collapse, but these springs will allow controlled collapse post-operatively also. So it may reduce further complications. One is the Targon FN femoral neck telescopic te telescrews by Oscular. They, they say that it provides a controlled collapse and similar principle, more stable, more rotationally stable avoids but still long-term results are awaited. So uh, our own Dr. G.S. Kesar has modified our own DHS by putting one hole and one screw just below the top screw so that there is just hardly a one millimeter or two millimeter gap is there between the, this is top nut and the screw. So this will just allow one or two millimeter excessive collapse and this will avoid excessive shortening of the neck. So furthermore, he has modified DHS into a LHS. So what he has done, he has uh, converted a regular top nut into a locking nut. So first you put a regular uh, top nut and you compress it and you replace with a locking nut so that it will not further collapse. So in the end, as mystery still remains unsolved, let's hope that our search for final ultimate implant of choice for fixation of neck femoral fracture, which is affordable and easily available, would end soon. Thank you. Uh, I would invite Dr. Samir Deshmukh for his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amit Zadho for a very fantastic uh, for a very fantastic presentation in fixations. So today my topic is on replacement options in intracapsular neck fractures. Uh, actually, the main indication for replacement. Uh, this is all well covered. Uh, by the earlier participant, the blood supply of the femoral head. Uh, it is the uh, blood supply that gets hampered when there is a subcapital fracture, uh, which further leads to a vascular necrosis of the femoral head, uh, commonly seen in older age groups. So this is the main mechanism, the traumatic disruption of the blood supply leads to an intracapsular hematoma and that causes a tamponade effect, which further decreases the blood supply to the femoral head and causing a vascular necrosis. So uh, replacements uh, is usually uh, for an older age group, which have a, comp com a compromised blood supply. There is a doubtful fracture healing always. The uh, bone stock is very poor for the implant fixation. So the consideration for a replacement as an initial or first surgery uh, is considered in these cases. Uh, also, it can also be considered in the failures of fixations and non uh, There was a study uh, done uh, where it showed that the hemiarthroplasty is associated with a very better functional outcome than the internal fixation in the treatment of a displaced fractures of femoral neck in elderly patients. So, uh, there are various modalities of uh, replacements available. One is hemiarthroplasty only replacing the femoral head. Uh, the implants are known, uh, non modular designs, commonly known as an Austin Moore prosthesis, uh, and the other is the Thomas prosthesis. The others are the modular designs, which are bipolars and unipolars. Uh, the Moore's prosthesis actually it is very cost effective, uh, it takes very less amount of operative time, uh, but the most disadvantage is poor fracture fixations. It is poor fixations and usually leads to an acetabular erosion, uh, which further leads to protrusia. Thompson's prosthesis is also the same thing. So all this, both the prostheses are reserved for a very limited and non-ambulatory and very low demand patients. Modular hypo, uh, modular arthroplasty is the choice that should be uh, given for all the patients with older age groups of uh, 60 years and above. Uh, we have to adjust the medial offsets, 
the limbing is answered uh, uh, and uh, the patient can move uh, right from the second day so the advantage is the same thing uh, and it can easily be converted uh, to thr that is paper hip replacement total hip replacement is uh, reserved for all those patients with a fracture neck femur uh, which are uh, above the age of 60s and they are highly active uh, there was a study which also showed that the total hip replacement is the treatment of choice for femoral neck fractures in a patient older than 60 years and the arthroplasty should be implanted in patient with limited life expectancy having cancers or other medical uh, problems of bone uh, there was also a study that uh, a hemi arthroplasty should be uh, done as a primary surgery in all the cases uh, elderly cases elderly patients above 60 years uh, as a primary treatment uh, so these are the arthroplasty options for the femoral neck fractures here yeah. Uh, usually, all these prostheses uh, we use a cement interface. Um, it gives good stability, but also on the other hand, it increases the anesthetic risk. Uh, so, various surgical approaches can be used. This is anterior anterolateral, posterior lateral, lateral posterior medial. Already been described earlier. Uh, there are some complications with uh, all the replacement surgeries: uh, implant loosening, implant breakage. A patient may fall again. There is a periprostatic fractures, uh, yeah, dislocation, and may lead to pivoting also. So thank you. I will hand over to to Mandar Pakmari first. Thank you, Mr. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Able to see full screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I am sh sharing my topic: pediatric femur neck fracture. So, first, start with the introduction. Uh, it's a rare fracture. I wonder, is there a problem? Can I help you? Doctor, is there a problem? Doctor Mandar, is there a problem? Can I help you?
I can't hear you, sir. I can't hear you. We can't hear you, sir. मंदार हेलो मंदार हेलो कंट हेयर यू मंदार सर हाँ वी कंट हेयर मंदार सर अच्छा अच्छा समीर सर इफ यू कैन अनम्यूट एंड पास ऑन द सॉरी देशमुख सर who is beside mandar sir if you can pass on your uh, headphones to him and on mute please unmute hello yeah, i can hear you sir yeah, yeah. are you able to see my screen sir yes yes yes, yes, yes. okay Is it is it just full screen no okay. can i can i start no yes yes okay but it is not moving sir okay. yes uh, so you just select the slides from just exit from full screen sir okay stop can i do a stop share no no just exit full screen press escape button yes okay Uh, then sir, now. Uh, now we can see, but then the slides aren't moving. Yeah, I, it's moving now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the delay. 
गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम प्रेजेंटिंग टॉपिक ऑफ एजेक्टिव ह्यूमन नेक फ्रैक्चर ओके लेट मी फर्स्ट स्टार्ट विद इंट्रोडक्शन है ना ऑडिबल ना यस सर थैंक यू सो टू स्टार्ट विद दिस नेक ह्यूमर पेडियाट्रिक नेक ह्यूमर फ्रैक्चर इज अ रेयर फ्रैक्चर कंस्टिट्यूट ओनली वन परसेंट ऑफ टोटल पेडियाट्रिक ट्रॉमा बिकॉज ऑफ द थिक एंड स्ट्रॉन्ग पेरी ऑफ स्कीम सो मोस्ट ऑफ दिस फ्रैक्चर इज एसोसिएटेड विथ हाई एनर्जी ट्रॉमा so there will be some associated injuries we need to see any form competent injuries uh, pelvic injuries uh, ischialic femur fracture pain injuries are are the common association this fracture is known to have uh, associated um, complication sk kanale aptly described this fracture uh, he stated that the hip fracture in children are of interest because of the frequency of the complication is called then the frequency of the fracture itself then the, uh, we come on to the relevant osteology so the femur neck uh, uh, and head is developed from two ossification center the proximal uh, femur epiphysis and secondary epiphysis so uh, proximal femur epiphysis is responsible for metaphyseal growth of the femur neck uh, the rate of growth uh, it contribute is the 3 mm per year so uh, and the total uh, uh, total growth of the lower limb is 23 mm per year so it contribute uh, uh, much less to the uh, longitudinal length of the lower limb then the uh, blood supply of the femur head is uh, we know it's a peculiar uh, blood supply peculiar is blood supply so t4 uh, years of age is majorly supplied by the middle circumflex femur artery lateral circumflex femur artery arthro ligamentum teres and metaphyseal artery so between 4 to 16 years is majorly supplied by the middle circumflex femur artery branches and after 16 years or after partial closure the supply by the median cervical femoral artery branches and metaphyseal arteries so now come to the uh, classification so the classification is a del bay type so it's the anatomical classification so type 1 is a transpartial type 2 is trans cervical type 3 is cervical trochanteric and type 4 is intertrochanteric this classification also in promotes significance we come to that in this. so type 1 uh, one uh, fracture is always subdivided into one a and one b so this is a one of the uh, radiograph showing type 1a fracture in the ap view you can see the uh, hardly you can see any fracture like but uh, usually so we recommended two views the another is the proglic view in the proglic view you can see lateral lateral is as a partial slip so two views are recommended and in the video graph you need to see for any uh, sign of facial uh, uh, separation or any uh, widening of the facies then uh, another sub type is type 1b so when 1b is a fracture uh, facial separation with dislocation so this is a uh, this may requires usually may require open reduction and uh, even chances for this type of fracture is uh, nearly 100% then type 2 is a trans cervical fracture uh, the most common type of fracture the radiograph shows trans cervical fracture so usually treated with a close reduction and for the time spinning so the fixation uh, varies with the age so uh, in the age of 4 years uh, we can put a smooth pin crossing the facies between 4 to 8 years it can be threaded 4 mm screw and above 8 years uh, Threaded 6.5 mm screws. Axillary decompression is also recommended. Uh, it uh, says that the after axillary decompression is after hematoma uh, aspiration, uh, the intraaxillary pressure decreases and which may reduce the chances of fall of the nucleus of femoral head. After fixation, uh, these structures are usually immobilized in a spica for around six weeks. Uh, if we are unable to achieve a, a good close reduction, then an open reduction is recommended. The threshold for open reduction should be low. Uh, the maneuver has been uh, uh, described by the Garros previously. So, mid better technique and uh, uh, longitudinal traction technique is commonly used. So, then the quality of reduction uh, is also covered. Uh, quality of reduction can be judged from the as we see the Lorentz curve. And we need to avoid the virus and the extension of the fracture. If we are able to achieve the good quality reduction, then we can uh, use the open technique, which is also required. 
also negotiate the work in order to this initially and towards the policy. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to invite our professor for the uh, first talk on stress and supply to the new team. Thank you. Thank you, Mandar. Is my screen visible? Not yet, Achin. Not yet. Mandar, do do the screen sharing. Banda ke laga. Oh, sir, ke la. Achin, we cannot see your screen. Can you please share it? Yeah. Now it's Is visible. Is it visible now? Now it's visible, Achin. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good evening everyone. Uh, my second talk is on stress and pathological fracture of neck of femur. So uh, let us start with stress fractures first. Uh, so what are stress fractures? These are injuries that occur when repetitive and excessive strain stress on a bone is combined with limited rest. This leads to muscle weakness and a lower shock absorbing capacity of the leg. So why this is important? Because if it is left untreated uh, with, uh, with subsequent fracture displacement, they can result in AVM necessitating a THR in a young athletic individual. Secondly, around 50% of all athletes who suffer these injuries fail to return to previous sporting levels with rate as high as 60% in those who suffer a displaced fracture. So early detection and management of undisplaced uh, stress fractures has been associated uh, with return rates as high as 100% to previous functional capacity, with rate as low as 0% for both development of AVN and need of delayed surgical intervention. On the contrary, if the fracture is displaced, then the risk of AVN and further intervention is as high as 42%. So they have found out that increased awareness of such injuries among medical staff along with educational programs and established treatment protocols have been shown to improve early detection of stress fractures, reducing the rates of displaced fractures and improving outcomes. Uh, femoral neck stress fractures make up to approximately 11% of all stress injuries in athletes uh, and account for 3% of all sports related stress fractures. The commonest positive sports are marathon and long distance running. There are two types of femoral <coughs> sorry, stress fractures. First is the tension type or the distraction type. It involves the superolateral aspect of the neck. They are highest risk for a complete fracture. So this should be detected early. The second is the compression type. It involves the inferomedial aspect of the femoral neck. These are seen in young, younger athletes. A trial of non-surgical management can be attempted without a visible fracture line or radiograph. This injury is more common in runners. So what are the risk factors? Uh, high intensity training, recreational runners, track and field, basketball, soccer, dancing, uh, dance, uh, women, poor nutrition and lifestyle activities, low vitamin D3 levels, female athlete tried, history of smoking, exercising less than three times a week, uh, alcohol of more than 10 alcohol drinks per week, genetic factors, change of surface, like indoor tracks, frozen field, biomechanical imbalances like limb, uh, leg length, foot arch, forefoot virus, stance of foot and ankle. Uh, to make a point, body mass index was not observed as a risk factor. So what is female athlete tried? It, uh, it consists of amenorrhea, eating disorder and osteoporosis. So it must be considered in any female athlete with stress fractures. Uh, what are the uh, symptoms? The most common presenting complaint is gradual onset hip or groin pain that is poorly localized. It is aggravated by activity and weight bearing, seizes with rest. The pain is most often sighted at anterior groin region. However, this can be located at the thigh or gluteal region and can radiate to the knee. 
patient often note a recent increase in intensity or duration of exercise such as preparation for a marathon or a sports event typically the pain is initially not noted late in the activity and then increases in intensity with prolonged participation in exercise often limiting or prohibiting further activities this is regularly associated with antalgic gait eventually the pain is noted at rest and at night so it progresses gradually these symptoms can be followed by an episode of uh, hip giving way or cracking or popping during exercise uh, as the fracture completes and displaces so signs can be uh, non specific the most the most uh, uh, consistent finding are the hip are the pain at the extremes of hip range of movement particularly with internal rotation tenderness over anterior aspect of the thigh uh, the pain can be aggravated if the patient performs a straight leg raise or if the examine examiner low grips the thigh So muscle strain, particularly quadriceps and iliopsoas tendinopathy, are the differential diagnosis. We we can use a plain X-ray, which in which it can be difficult to see the fracture or bone scan. MRI has the highest sensitivity and specificity, and ultrasonography. So this is the X-ray uh, showing a complete compression type of uh, fracture. Here, this is on the. MRI T1 sequence and this is on the STAR image. We can see the line very clearly, which is very difficult to see it on the X-ray. So coming to the management, uh, it can be divided into two types: incomplete when the less than 50% of the femoral neck is involved and when the fracture is complete. So in compression types, conservative unless there is significant pain or unable to straight uh, leg raise. In tension type, we have to fix it even if it is not complete. And in compression type, if the fracture is more than fifty percent, then surgical fixation with hip screw or DHS. And in tension type, again fixation. So, what is the rehab protocol uh, when you are when we are managing it conservatively, limited weight bearing with crutches until completely free of pain? This can be between six to eight weeks, but can in certain patients take up to fourteen weeks. During this time, uh, the progression should be non weight bearing to total weight bearing. Partial weight bearing to full weight bearing as pain is tolerated. Upper limb condition also can be initiated. Hydro therapy can be undertaken, uh, wearing an inflatable inflatable jacket for support in case of falls. Uh, athletic activities are commenced only when there is a clear evidence of fracture union, both radiologically and clinically. Uh, at 12 weeks, strengthening and ROM exercises around the hip. Uh, six, three to six months gentle running program, ensuring the patient remains pain free throughout, and six months to one year he can return to full sport. When the patient is surgically uh, operated, non non weight bearing to total weight bearing with crutches for six weeks, partial weight bearing with crutches for further six weeks. After this, weight bearing as permitted, uh, as per tolerated. Rehabilitation can follow the guideline of conservative management. How to prevent? Modify their training schedules. Wear shock-absorbing shoe inserts. Insoles lowers the incidence because it improves biomechanics, less fatigue, and limits the impact on the ground. Uh, calcium and vitamin D supplementation to be taken regularly. Leg muscle stre stretching during warm-up has no significant effect on prevention. So, what are the complications? It can lead to complete fracture. Uh, it can settle in varus. a vascular necrosis non union or refracture uh, now coming to pathological fractures uh, pathological fractures uh, they present differently in children and adults so coming to children these are very rare until now all report reported cases have been isolated cases or a small series or case reports in series of adult pathologic hip fractures so uh, most commonly involved are uh, etiology is fibrous dysplasia bone cyst osteogenesis imperfecta ilin sarcoma osteomyelitis leukemia rhabdomyelitis sarcoma and osteopetrosis so this is an extra of the fibrous dysplasia showing a uh, lytic lesion here with a fracture so let us uh, uh, see about fibrous dysplasia so enneking has uh, treated six pediatric patients with cortical bone grafting funken wells has four pediatric patients in his series two of whom had pathological fractures Which were treated by cancellous bone grafting. The uh, biggest series was by Wade. Uh, he had five patients. Uh, 
three of which were treated with bone grafting in internal fixation, one with bone grafting alone, and one simply with protected bone uh, weight bearing. So, what is the outcome? It it can either land up in malunion. Uh, very important thing is, is these fractures take almost 19 weeks uh, for union uh, in almost every series, which is considerably longer than typically seen in traumatic pediatric femoral neck fractures. Both the parents and physicians should be cognizant of the long time required for healing in these pathologic fractures. Most of the complications, uh, which, which we consisted around 40% for minor, but still the most important was limb length discrepancies. Parents should also be made aware of this risk before initiation of the treatment. Coming to adults, <coughs> pathological fractures can be caused by any bone lesion which can be benign, primary malignant or metastatic. But metastatic bone tumors and multiple myeloma are the most common. Uh, primary malignancies from breast, thyroid, kidney and lung, prostate can uh, go to bone. So uh, when it comes to bone, the vertebral column is the most commonly affected by bony metastasis. But when it is in the perpendicular skeleton, proximal femur is the most common site. Uh, the strong deforming forces across the hip joint disproportionately predisposes the proximal femur to pathological fractures. In the hip, 50% uh, are located in the neck, 20% in the intertrochanteric area and remaining 30% are in the rest of the femur. So uh, there is a long list of differential diagnosis. Before doing anything, we should be confirmed of uh, which primary pathology is causing the uh, pathological fracture. We need to investigate uh, the patient completely uh, and thoroughly before intervening anything. So determinants must be made prior to operative management if the lesion is solitary or a metastatic lesion. Imaging of the entire femur is necessary to determine if there are other lesions present. Bone lesions that have a large size, permeative appearance, soft tissue mass and a rapid growth are all characteristics that suggest an aggressive lesion. Biopsy of the lesion in coordination with operating surgeon should be conducted if primary tumor is unknown. Uh, treatment these fractures usually necessitate operative management. Life expectancy must be taken into account in management, but if the survivorship is greater than one month, operative intervention is indicated. Uh, coming to prophylactic fixation, we take we consider the mirror scoring system. If the score is less than 7, then we can manage it conservatively. If the score is more than 7, then the uh, even if it is not fractured, uh, still it will need a prophylactic fixation. Many metastatic fractures in intertrochanteric region and all fractures in femoral neck and head are an indication for hemiarthroplasty or total hip arthroplasty. Uh, cemented implants are generally indicated. This allows limited weight bearing in bone with compromised bone stock, thus reducing the risk of perioperative fractures. Additionally, the patients are often treated with irradiation or chemotherapy, which may prevent proper osteoindrotic integration of ingrowth femoral component. Highly porous ingrowth shells have been shown to provide reliable and durable fixation even in this situation. Patients with neoplastic disease are often at risk for infection and thromboembolic disease, both from the disease and the treatment. So care, be, care should be taken. Preoperative evaluation of nutrition status by measuring albumin and pre albumin will give the insight to the surgeon. Additionally, dehydration is commonly seen in cancer patients and adequate preoperative optimization with fluids and electrolytes may reduce perioperative complications. Thank you. I would uh, invite our respected honorable president, sir, for his lecture. Ajin. Sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. You, you just stop the sharing screen? Yes, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. So good evening all. Uh, today's talk is on fracture neck femur. I will be speaking on complications and its treatment in fracture neck femur. Okay. 
so complication in fracture neck tumor they are systemic complication yes, and local complication systemic complication deep vein thrombosis pulmonary embolism pneumonia and related problem sorry sir to cut you in between we uh, kale sir we cannot see the slides it okay. is stuck the powerpoint presentation is stuck okay just a minute now are you able to see the slides yes sir now we can see complication of fracture neck uh, tumor complications of fracture neck tumor yes sir. systemic complication few of them are deep vein thrombosis pulmonary embolism pneumonia and related problems bed sore and other complications related to bed redundancy but these are out of purview of today's discussion local complications are non union avascular necrosis and mal union now to consider first with non union there are some factors which contribute to non union in fracture neck femur these are as neck femur is absent of periosteum there is a synovial fluid around the fracture which keeps on washing out the new bone formation and if there is a vertical fracture line it's a, it is having more shear forces and which causes non union high velocity trauma leading to the vascular damage and comminution at the fracture site is one of the major factor which is associated with non union now there are some systemic factors which contribute to the non union with older age obesity addictions to tobacco and alcohol and other addictions comorbidities like metabolic diseases and tumors and medications now coming towards treatment of non union of fracture neck femur we can treat the non union by osteosynthesis or we can treat it with arthroplasty arthroplasty might be might be total hip arthroplasty it might be the hemi arthroplasty or it might be the excisional arthroplasty when we attempt osteosynthesis in non union fracture neck femur if patient's age is below 65 years physiological age i am talking about and if he is having good quality of bone stock acetabulum is normal and patient demands squatting and cross legged sitting then you must go for osteosynthesis in non union fracture neck tumor now for osteosynthesis in non union fracture neck tumor anatomical reduction and fixation strong fixation is mandatory which may be added with powell's osteotomy to convert vertical fracture line to more horizontal line it may be v osteotomy or it may be y osteotomy you must have to keep macmurray's osteotomy at the back of your mind though it is very rarely done nowadays because of its complications shans pelvic supportive osteotomy is one option where there might be infection or something like that where you cannot salvage the hip then there are some bone grafting procedures which are described in treatment of osteogenesis uh, osteosynthesis of neck femur in addition to anatomic reduction and fixation these might be the free fibula graft then vascularized fibula graft muscle pedicle graft like mayer's graft or in situ cancellous graft at the fracture site through richards screw trap powell osteotomy is one of the most popular method nowadays for treating non union of fracture neck femur it has few advantage because it converts the vertical fracture line to more horizontal fracture line it corrects coxa vera it gives distal migration of greater trochanter and hence achieves abductor length it avoids medial migration of the distal fragment and associated complications like genu genu valgum and oeni it 
causes ability to squat and sit cross legged and union rate of non union after powell's osteotomy is documented up to 92% which is very high for non union neck tumor it may be v shaped or osteotomy or it may be y shaped osteotomy you can see that here the wedge is lateral base wedge is removed with its apex on the cortex uh, medial cortex at the level of lesser trochanter and the shape is v shaped and that is why it is called as v powell's osteotomy now y shaped powell's osteotomy it is also called as neutral wedge osteotomy y osteotomy it closes laterally and opens medially that is why it is called as neutral wedge where remove the wedge from the lateral aspect of half of the femur and this laterally wedge removed laterally removed wedge can be used on the medial opening of osteotomy so this wedge is used as a bone graft this is the example he is a 22 years old boy with implant failure and non union of intracapsular fracture neck tumor because you the non union was treated with y powell's osteotomy with richard screw and a cc screw as a implant for fixation and grafts were used medially laterally removed wedge was used as a graft this is six and half year post operative where you can see that it is beautifully united with achieved abductor length and this is a functional outcome patient is able to sit cross legged and squatting which is very necessary in this part of world where they are commode and all chairs are not amenable for them this is one another case this is just eight weeks post op now where there is a non union of intracapsular fracture neck femur the y osteotomy fixed here with angle blade plate and grafts really removed wedge is used as a graft over here on the medial side by eight weeks you can see that the fracture or non union is uniting and osteotomy is also uniting we hope that by four to six weeks may more the both fracture as well as osteotomy will be united completely fibular stud graft they can be used across the fracture site while treating the non union in addition to the implant cc screw or richard screw whatever surgeon is familiar with these are fibular grafts stud grafts which are used in case of non union vascular fibula it is a lengthy or it needs high technically demanding procedure and i am not experienced i have never seen it and that is why i have not mentioned it over here the another complication in intracapsular fracture neck femur is avascular necrosis of the femur there are some high risk factor which are associated with avascular necrosis in icnf these are high velocity trauma causing the vascular compromise and comminution fracture displacement at the time of fracture more the displaced displacement more are the chances of avascular necrosis of femoral head poor quality of fracture re reduction when you do fixation will lead to may lead to avascular necrosis of femoral head inadequate fracture fixation and bmi of more than 25 is documented as a high risk for developing avascular necrosis of femoral head incidence of avascular necrosis in neck femur fracture is documented up to 25%
X-rays, CT scan, PET scan, and MRI. These are the investigations which are helpful to diagnose avascular necrosis in case of kidney tumor. Incidence of AVN is documented from 15 to 25 percent. These avascular necrosis they manifest by six month of trauma. Most of them will be manifested by two years. Tendency, there is always tendency to revascularize in initial phase. So even if the head in young adult, if head is, you are in doubt that his head is bit little avascular, then also you should go and try for fixation of uh, non-union. Once they are symptomatic, there is less chance to reward the avascular necrosis. Head preservation becomes difficult in the presence of implant. Collapse progresses more rapidly after removal of implant, probably because the mechanical support is lost. And most of these avascular necrosis in presence of implant or post fracture neck femur, they will land up with total hip arthroplasty day or another. Now treatment option, there are head preserving, preserving surgeries like core decompression and bone grafting. It might be fibular strut graft, it might be vascular fibular graft or bone grafting techniques like trapdoor technique or light bulb procedure or it might be the muscle pedicle graft like Meyer's graft and rotational osteotomics. Now there are head sacrificing tre treatment options which are popular nowadays because as the THA or metallurgy is improving day by day, the arthroplasties are getting popular in case of avian which are post fracture neck femur or post fixation of fracture neck femur. Now hemi-arthroplasty, hemi it can be done only if the patient has life expectancy of less than 10 years. Otherwise, it, is, it gives far inferior result as compared to total hip arthroplasty, which is preferred when patient is active and there are acetabular changes, then we go for total hip arthroplasty. In few instances, excisional arthroplasty, in presence of infection, you can think it of I had an incidence that patient was operated for fracture neck femur who had a bad episode of infection. So I removed the implant. This was few years before. I removed the implant and did a excisional arthroplasty and called the patient for arthroplasty or replacement arthroplasty at the later date. But as they being uh, from rural population, they were happy with the result. They were able to sit cross-legged and squatting and they refused for replacement arthroplasty. Avian has a complication of fracture neck femur. Most of them will land up with arthroplasty today or after few days. These are few decoring and bone grafting procedures like fibular stud graft, flask technique, trapdoor technique and reverse bone graft. Now malunion, malunion might be the may result in a short neck or coxa breva or coxa valve. Few years before, coxa breva or short neck with union at the fracture neck femur, we used to call it as an excellent result or good result. But now as we are studying more and more. Our ideas are getting clear and clear. We know that a patient with short neck has a considerable disability and now probably short neck cannot be considered as a good or excellent result. And that's why you must prevent the collapse at the fracture site. This, com this complication of mal malunion or short neck, it is better to prevent than treatment because 
it causes a shortening and limb length discrepancy because of proximal migration of trochanter it leads to inefficient abductor mechanism and resulting in limb and early fatigue abductor mechanism the length is short in case of proximal migration or coxa breva or short neck and patient walks with trendelenburg test and which causes limb and easy fatigue with short neck or abductor insufficiency so coxa breva most of the time it is compatible with the life though patient is having early fatigue and limb it will need treatment in demanding patient it can be treated by powell's osteotomy to retention the abductors or replacement arthroplasty coxa vera is never acceptable fixation will fail one day it has to be treated with powell osteotomy or intrafocal osteotomy or replacement of arthroplasty thank you very much thank you sir for an excellent talk thank you to all the speakers who have done an excellent job with their talks uh there are certain questions for the panel am i audible am i audible yeah yeah uh so uh there are certain questions for the panel first sir i had a question for kade sir yes uh sir i just wanted to know is there an indication for a valgus osteotomy primarily in a neck femur fracture a young neck femur fracture yes there is there is a in, people used to do primary osteotomy when there was no good implants but with richard screw and uh, biomechanics what we study now amit has uh, demonstrated the fixation of multiple screw in multiple planes as well as richards with a additional cc screw and newer metallurgy now primary osteotomy by and large is not done or is not required today but when we were, we were resident that time we used to do powell's osteotomy as a primary treatment in vertical <coughs> fractures okay sir thank you uh amit i also had a question for you yeah so when you are doing your close reduction for a neck femur fracture how many attempts do you give or is there like a literature or or, or your practical experience how many attempts of close reduction should you take before you know thinking that this needs an open reduction only yeah uh <clears throat> by literature and by my experience also it is said that two to three attempts of close reduction uh, should be given and if it is not possible then you should uh, have low threshold for opening the fracture and do open reduction fine tuning okay. can be done without any uh, further damage to the blood supply but if you are yeah. not able to get any acceptable near acceptable reduction minor yeah. it is said that minor uh, mild reduction is little acceptable than open reduction because few studies are saying that uh, the re open reduction and close reduction in little mild position the long term results are same rather the infection and other complications are more with open reduction but near normal uh, reduction should be acceptable otherwise uh, low threshold for opening it okay thank you then there are certain hey, questions hello our... amit hazar uh do you have experience with uh... joystick maneuver for reduction of fracture neck femur the where you don't get reduction by close maneuver okay you can put the k wire and joystick the head to get the reduction yes sir yes sir. i have shown it in my presentation also and uh, at times uh, we can get away with without opening it thank you yes sir uh, amit there are certain questions on the panel as well so one okay. one of the questions for you is what's the relation between implant position and chances of avn and how would you reduce the avn chances so with your implant uh look uh, it is it is again one a controversial issue uh, now there are few papers new papers coming on details of blood supply 
so they yeah. said as per new literature they said that peripheral implant uh, whatever i said ki peripheral implants should be placed to avoid uh, mal reduction or to avoid the forces or to avoid the virus collapse but now new literature is saying that peripherally there is scarcity of blood supply so you should avoid putting your implants in periphery like on medial part of the head on lateral part of the head in central there is little more anastomosis so mm -hmm. uh, peripheral implant placement especially in the superior cortex where the superior retinacular vessel enters the head the superior aspect of the head should be avoided for plating for, for putting the black screw so this mm -hmm. but it is again a controversial it is not full proof what i am saying yeah all right okay uh, some question for dr achin achin for you there are there is a question that how will you confirm reduction of posterior wall when you are doing an open reduction so there is comminution in the posterior wall how will you confirm the reduction uh, no we cannot uh, go uh, we cannot see the posterior uh, uh, wall and the border from the anterolateral or the anterior approach that is the drawback you need to see it in cm only so do you can you get a, a proper dead lateral in your cm i mean yeah. is it possible to get all the times Yes, so if the if it if it is on the fracture table or even if it is not on the fracture table, we can still get it. Achin, a dead lateral is possible all the time. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Achin. Yes, sir. Can I add one thing? Yeah, please, sir. When you open the fracture, you are able to see anterior cortex. Yes, sir. And if there is a anterior proper in inter digitation done. Okay. of anterior cortex then mostly the posterior cortex is reduced yes sir that is an indirect uh, uh, evidence but we cannot palpate it posteriorly since we are not going posterior you should not palpate it yes sir so the question was like that so it is not possible if if the reduction is there anteriorly uh, then uh, we can and if in the cm we can see then we can say uh, the fracture is reduced Yeah. So the consensus is, if there if there is a posterior comminution, you won't be able to assess the reduction, uh, like by palpation. You'll only have to go by CM images to see that your yeah. reduction is adequate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Amit, there is another question for you. That what are the tips to prevent collapse at the fracture site on fixation with CC screws vis-a-vis -vis using a DHS and the derotation screw? If okay, bone quality is good, then the collapse in Uh, unnecessarily collapse what you call unnecessarily collapse and shortening of the neck will be uh, we are with neck uh, will be less possible with multiple screws as well as dhs but mm -hmm. these are out of our control these multiple uh, cc screws and dhs are uh, usually give un required collapse so it is out of our question but if bone quality is good and your hold is good unnecessarily collapse will be avoided Okay. That's why we are going towards locking system, but still locking system is also not full proof because some 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 sort of collapse is desirable, but more collapse than that is uh, not desirable. Ultimately, leading to poor function. Meet. Ah. Okay. Yes, sir. Can I add? Yes, sir. If you want to prevent the collapse, then there are some maneuvers which can be do. Okay. Done. First. the comp uh, d rotation screw which we use partially threaded we should use full threaded screw though it is not uh, very uh, proved very much proved but it is one of the major and second thing uh, people used to put the these cc screw or richards and a cc screw parallel in both the planes both the x rays ap and lateral but now the consensus is that these uh, should be divergent divergent screws and they yes. will pre prevent the excessive collapse yes. first you uh, compress with a richard screw and the uh, d rotation screw should be divergent to guide wire of cc screw that will that, that is one of the maneuver where you can prevent the uh, collapse Yes, sir. divergent uh, fixation can avoid collapse. And uh, once one what sir said, that replacing a fully partially threaded screw by a fully threaded screw, 
few people have got very good result and few people have got non unions also so it is also not very uh, recommended that fully threaded screws are the treatment of choice but it can be done to avoid excessive collapse Right. And you, what you have described as a Powell screw, that is also one of the manure. Yes, sir. Which prevents the collapse. That is very useful screw to prevent excessive collapse. Right. Okay. Another inter interesting question uh, for all the panels. Say, if you have a geriatric patient who comes with neck femur. So, when will you decide that this patient will go for a hemi-arthroplasty and when will you decide that, no, I would uh, rather conserve the head and go for osteopreservation and do a fixation? Can I answer it? Yes, sir, please. All patients who, whose age is physiologically up to 60 to 65 years, active patient, by and large, these active patients are having good bone stock. And they should always, always, always be given trial of osteosynthesis. The patients above 65 years of age, but still active, they should, but they can be subjected to total hip arthroplasty. If you are in doubt whether you will be able to achieve osteosynthesis or not. And hemi arthroplasty should be reserved only for the patients whose life expectancy is not more than 10 years. That means the patient who are above 75 to 80 years of the age. Because total hip arthroplasty is having far superior outcome as compared to hemi arthroplasty. Right. Uh, sir, can I add? Yes, please. Sir, it, it depends upon fracture type also. I think if the patient is active 60, physiologically 65, but his fracture is completely displaced with comminution. So in such cases, it is better to go for a replacement rather than having a high chances of failure, fixation failure. So if it's if it's valgus impacted in a geriatric patient also, suppose 70 year old valgus impacted and displaced fracture, you can go for osteosynthesis. But in, in this borderline age group, suppose patient is of 65, physiologically active 65, but grossly displaced fracture with gross comminution. So there are very less chances that it will get successful with fixation. So I think fracture pattern and fracture type also plays an important role in decision. Yes, yes, I have said that the patient whose age is above 65 years or physiological age above 65 years, where you cannot, uh, where, where you are in doubt, regarding osteosynthesis, these patients can be subjected to total hip arthroplasty rather than going for hemi arthroplasty. Yes, sir. My question to you, uh, to Amit sir and Kare sir, what with a patient with a high velocity trauma, though young, with a displaced fracture and presenting late to you, uh, say around 50, 55, not so young, but a middle aged person, so, do you go for osteosynthesis or uh, you directly go for a replacement there? Definitely for osteosynthesis. If he is 55 years, whatever might be the time of presentation, even after three months, I will go for osteosynthesis. So, it's a high velocity trauma. Whatever it might be. He will present within a day, two, three, something like that. Or we can't operate because of certain things, driving certain coma. Uh, other injuries? 55 years of the age, I will definitely go for osteosynthesis. Sir, I think uh, uh, there can be a different school of thought also on this. Uh, suppose the fracture is very high velocity and patient is 55 years old and there is significant combination. I mean, I'm, I'm explaining the fracture type. In such types, in a 55-year-old, you can think of a active lifestyle and uh, pain-free lifestyle by giving him a replacement. This is one of one of the uh, one thought in such patient. 55 years is a borderline age with, as sir said, it's a high velocity injury. So again, very high chances of fixation failure. So uh, this is one uh, thought I can say that replacement can be a, at, at back of our mind uh, before giving only fixation option. Me. Sir, should I add, add on this? 
yes samir please yes sir uh, i totally agree with uh, kale sir 55 years whatever it is go for osteosynthesis replacement is only for a older age groups secondly if on mri if you are able to or it is really very difficult to establish a, a, a vascularity of the head at such a early age but whatsoever it is 55 years go for osteosynthesis above 65 yes go for dhr is very good if the patient is active if the patient has a very low life expectancy then go for hemiarthroplasty so i agree with kai sir whatever the presentation is there if the age is less go for synthesis so what my question was ki where we will see in literature what are the patient who goes in non union because having a displaced fracture having a high velocity trauma presenting late these are the factors where we see that the patient the chances of non union are more so if a patient comes with these factors to you directly it's not a simple neck tumor fracture presenting in a month or a day or a non union young patient it's a patient with all the predisposing factors which goes for non union so if he present here and considering today's lifestyle he wants to go to work he wants a uh, painless or a painless mobility so what options should we give should we give him a trial of uh, osteosynthesis or should we directly go for the replacement i i i need, uh, i want to add one point if it is okay i think the patient's view also matters here because he uh, what are his circumstances what are his relatives uh, circumstances is there in any caretaker present with him uh, all these factors we have the discussion of the patient also we can change our uh, line of management hello ah ranjit ah bola in this part of maharashtra probably 55 years of the patient a 55 year old patient he will demand squatting and sitting cross legged if he demands sitting cross legged and squatting you must give trial of osteosynthesis i think the elite group who can have chair life they can be subjected to total hip arthroplasty if you are in very much doubt that whether you, we will be able to achieve union or not neck fever we always have a doubt whether we achieve union or not <laughs> Okay, it was a good talk. They just, I think, we should conclude it. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I think the take-home message, at least for the the junior, our junior orthopedic colleagues who are listening, should be that osteosynthesis or preserving the natural bo- uh, joint is very imperative, especially when you have a physiologically younger age group, probably even fifty-five and younger, and as per the clinical experience of all of us even up to 65 if they are phys- physiologically active we should try to save the head of course uh, it should be looked at case on case basis as uh, amit rightly pointed out that if they are highly displaced and uh, you think that there are high chances and even achin's point is well taken that you have to also look at the social aspects and if socially also the patient is say a, a, a nursing home patient or someone who does not have a caretaker probably an arthroplasty would be a good choice so i think uh, we have had an excellent discussion by all these esteemed uh, panel and i would like to thank um, uh, all of them especially i would like to thank ranjit deshmukh sir who organized this cme and who got all the speakers involved i would like to thank uh, ima president uh, uh, and senior orthopedic surgeon from akola dr mahendra kade sir as well as all the speakers um, uh, dr amit jadhav dr Raha, dr Sa- dr samir deshmukh Uh, dr mandar wagmare dr parth gawatre uh, and uh, uh, all the all the especially all the all the listeners as well so with this we conclude our, our cme and i thank once again the tech team uh, from digi shield for giving us a seamless experience for this webinar as well and we look forward to further association thank you very much thank you
Thank you. Uh, um, just a minute. Uh, Tejas? Yes. yes, sir. When, when is our uh, next CME schedule? So the next CME for IMA Akola for our, our branch is scheduled on 19th, uh, which is again the, the part two of uh, how to's of fitness for doctors by doctors. Thank you. Thank you, sir.